Okay, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the first episode of Wolf School Season 2. My name is Chelsea Greer and I work with the Raincoast Conservation Foundation. Um, we'll give it about a minute to let people arrive and settle into this space. Um, if you're calling in either from Facebook or YouTube, you can use the chat function to participate in this talk today. So as you sign in here, please let us know where you're calling in from, um, whose ancestral territory you might be on right now. It's always really interesting to hear where folks are situated when they join our webinars. Um, and we're really excited to have so many people join. And as we go along, please do feel free to post questions in the chat function and we'll do our best to get to them. Um, and yeah, if you're joining us just now, um, welcome again for, to our first class of Wolf School 2. Um, again, please feel free to use the chat box um, to let us know where you're calling in from. Um, I'm just gonna look at some of the comments here. We've got people coming in from Austria, from Washington. Welcome. Um, and yeah, so now that I can see, we've got about 60 people joining us so far. Um, I, and again, feel free to use the chat to um, tell us where you're calling in from, but I think we're gonna get started here. So to everyone who's calling in, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Again, my name is Chelsea Greer. I work for Raincoast Conservation Foundation as director of our wolf conservation program. And this is the first episode of our second season of Wolf School. So in 2020, during the pandemic, Raincoast hosted the first rendition of Wolf School, um, which you can find, I'm just gonna pop this link here, um, which you can find on our website at the link below. Um, I'm beyond excited and honored to be hosting this season of Wolf School, so thank you so much for joining us. This season we'll be exploring the role of animal welfare and environmental ethics in wolf conservation research policy and practice. Um, you are invited to hear from and pose questions from a range of experts, including conservation ethicists and biologists uh, to wildlife photographers and wolf educators. So normally at all of our events for Raincoast, we do a territorial acknowledgement. So we wanna acknowledge the lands on which we're engaging on. And before I acknowledge the lands on which I'm situated today, I would like to state that I am here on this land as a settler. Uh, my family names have roots in England and Scotland. And I know we may have some folks calling in from different parts of the world who may not know this about British Columbia, but today most of the province remains unceded sovereign native lands. And this means that this land was never surrendered, relinquished, or handed over in any way. Um, so I just want to acknowledge that I occupy stolen, unceded Indigenous land belonging to Coast Salish peoples. And today I'm hosting from the shared territories of the Tisleiwatooth, Squamish, and Musqueam peoples, also known as the city of Vancouver. And I would like to uh, welcome you all to make your own land acknowledgements in the chat box. So again, audience members are tuning in today from either Facebook or YouTube. And like I said at the beginning of the presentation, you can participate by um, entering any questions that you might have into the chat on either platform. Um, I'll be monitoring this chat throughout the presentation and collect your questions to, pro to pose to our guest speaker um, following his presentation. And Raincoast is running this Wolf School um, in collaboration with the Wolf Conservation Center. Um, and we're gonna be joining them on March 29th for our fourth episode, which happens to coincide with the anniversary of the return of Mexican great wolves to the wild. So thank you so much to them. Thank you to our colleagues at Raincoast and everyone that's been sharing information about Wolf School. We really appreciate it. And I'm just going to bring in um, our guest speaker. Welcome, John. Hello, it's good to be here. Great, it is my privilege to introduce um, Dr. John Busetich. Um, John is a distinguished professor at Michigan Technological University, where he teaches population biology and environmental ethics. He co-leads the Isle Royale Wolf Moose Project, which is the longest continuous study of any predator prey system in the world. He has authored more than 100 scholarly publications, mostly focused on the biodiversity crisis, carnivore conservation, and environmental policy and philosophy. Um, his writings have also appeared in, for example, the New York Times and Natural History. John is also 
the author of the book, Restoring the Balance, What Wolves Tell Us About Our Relationship with Nature. He has testified before committees in the United States House and Senate about con carnivore conservation and the Endangered Species Act. And John's ability to relate ecological science and environmental ethics has captured the attention of scholars, the general public, and governments around the world. So thank you and welcome, John. I'm going to add your presentation here and take it away. Well, wonderful. Well, my goodness. Thanks so much for a lovely introduction. And thanks so much for sharing your time this afternoon or this evening, depending on what part of the world you're listening from. And um, well, I, you know, I think we'll just get straight into it. You know, the, the, what I was asked to do is to provide a little bit of an overview about the nature of ethics. Um, you got to understand that's like providing in the short time that we have an overview of a field like, say, biology. Ethics is a, is a huge, vast field and you can't do it in 20 minutes the 20 minutes that I'll have to kind of share with you and then the follow up for question and answer and so forth. So I'm gonna be two things. I'm gonna be very selective and probably when we're done, you'll be able to even uh, judge that it's a bit idiosyncratic, but I think I think still in a, in a really quite useful way, I'm gonna talk about purpose as in like, what is the purpose of one's life, value and how those two things relate to the ethics of, of biodiversity. And to kind of situate ourselves here, let me, uh, get the controls figured out here. Here we go, I think. To situate ourselves, and we're going to start talking about purpose, let's just recognize a few problems. One problem that we have is something like 20% of vertebrate species are threatened with extinction. The average vertebrate species has been extirpated from two-thirds or more of its former range. We're exceeding planetary boundaries in a way that's very likely headed for catastrophe. And something like 10% of humans hold 80% of, of the world's wealth. And now the goals or the solutions to these problems are this, right? To avert the biodiversity crisis and to realize sustainability. Now, as so obviously good as those two goals are, I don't think we're gonna achieve them unless we better understand the question, why? Why are those our goals? What is the underlying purpose of achieving those goals? And you might think, oh my goodness, that our purpose is obvious. I think I can give an example in just a few minutes that would suggest that the purpose might be, at least at a societal level, um, not as, as, as clear cut. And so I wanted to start off with this question, what exactly is the underlying purpose of sustainability and of averting the biodiversity crisis? I'm going to start with an example, and it's an example that's connected with some uh, of my professional work, uh, and that involves uh, this part of the world, which is where I'm speaking to you from now. I live on that peninsula that juts up from the south shore of Lake Superior, and I do a lot of work on Isle Royale National Park. Isle Royale National Park is home to the longest study of any predator prey system in the world. Um, the study's been going on for more than six decades. It's characterized by a population of wolves and a population of moose. They uh, exist there as a single predator and a single prey. So the wolves eat the moose and the moose, their primary cause of death is to either be killed by a wolf or, or to starve to death. The centerpiece of, of that work um, has been to count the abundance of wolves and moose. And we can see that here going from the first years of the study and the late 50s and early 60s, all the way up to about the year 2017. The, the white dots, that's the number of wolves. The black dots, those are the number of moose. And you can see they ebb and flow over time. But by about the year 2017, the wolves had been reduced uh, to just two wolves. And the, the last three wolves are depicted right here. The two wolves uh, that are kind of in the lead there on the right, uh, they are brother and sister. And they're also father and daughter. Um, and so they're, they're wildly inbred. They only produced one pup that never lived for more than uh, about six months. And that pup is the third wolf that was there, died, died very young. And so that circumstance uh, led to a question for the United States National Park Service, which is, should wolf predation be restored? If nothing was to be done, those last two wolves, they would have died without reproducing and then, and then wolves would have gone extinct. 
And so to understand the nature of this question, it really wasn't just about wolves in one place. It really was a, a, a surrogate for a much broader question, which is, should we be mitigating climate change effects in protected areas? And to understand the connection here, it's important to know a little bit of the biogeography. Isle Royal is an island, as you can see there in Lake Superior. Many winters, for many winters, there's an ice bridge that forms between the mainland and the island. And when an ice bridge forms, it becomes possible for, um, for a wolf to come from the mainland to the island. And that happens occasionally, accepting that climate warming has made those ice bridges um, very infrequent. And so that movement of wolves from the mainland to the island doesn't occur frequently enough anymore. As a result, the population on that island has become isolated and they became very inbred. And that was what drove them right to the precipice of extinction. And so again, that was the kind of the background for this question, should wolves be restored to this island? And it was a difficult question for the park service to address and they, uh, contemplated and, and appreciated two different kinds of answers. One answer, very simply, was yes. And the reason why would be to protect ecosystem health. And if that's to be a good reason, you have to ask the question, okay, well, I think I need you to tell me a little bit more about what you mean by ecosystem health. Well, there are as many definitions of ecosystem health as there are people who have written about the subject. But almost all definitions fall into one of two camps. And one of those camps is that ecosystems are healthy when they serve our human needs. And the other answer is that ecosystems are healthy when they're unaffected by humans. And the concern with those two answers, especially since they seem to be more or less the only two answers, the only two kind of standard answers, is that the first answer is a little bit anthropocentric. It's a little bit probably too human-centered, which is the attitude that has created so many environmental problems in the first place. The second answer, think risks being misanthropic because if ecosystems are only healthy when they're unaffected by humans, it, it basically makes humans you know, kind of innately the bad guys. And so, well, if this was the only answer that people were positing, you might be able to live with the fact, well, okay, sure, there's some shortcomings in those answers, but it's still probably a reasonable answer. It's not the case because there were other folks that thought that the answer should be no. And when asked why, the answer they would provide is because on a, in a protected area, we should be letting nature take its course. And it's a natural thing for a population on a very small island to sometimes go extinct. That's the nature of islands. And the, the trouble with that kind of reasoning is twofold. One part of it is that there is a logical fallacy that's known as appeal to nature. And a logical fallacy is an argument or a structure for an argument. And it would go something like this. A first premise, X is natural. And X could stand for anything, the food you buy in a grocery store or a, a certain behavior that a person exhibits. And you would say, that's natural. And then the second premise is that, well, whatever's natural is good. Therefore, this thing, these, this cat and crunch cereal that I bought at the store, it must be good. And um, that's fallacious logic because there's plenty of things that are natural that aren't good. And there's plenty of things that are that maybe wouldn't count as natural, but are more than fine. The other thing that's important about this reasoning is that if you say the purpose of a park is to let nature take its course, it requires you to put a sharp boundary between humans and the rest of nature. And it, it's, a, it's an enduring question that doesn't have a definitive answer. Are humans and nature fundamentally separate? or are we one and the same? And so you see the two answers, um, they, they, they're they not seemingly robust to that question about why it is to restore wolves. And I, I think the trouble is because managers that were wrestling with the question, they didn't know precisely well enough what the purpose of a protected area is. Because if you knew with enough precision the purpose of a protected area, you'd be able to answer the question pretty readily whether you should bring wolves back there or not. That's a a specific concrete kind of a decision, I can exp express the same concern about purpose, but in, in like the grandest way. And we can do it with talking about the very nature of sustainability. Again, sustainability is an idea for which there are as many definitions of it as there are people who have written about it. Here's a really useful definition. It goes like this. Sustainability is meeting human needs in a socially just manner without compromising conservation. So it's about balancing three different things, human needs, social justice, 
and conservation. For that to really have meaning, you have to answer questions like, what exactly do you mean by human needs? Do you mean the stuff that we really, really, really need? Or do you mean the stuff that we really, really, really want? And what do we mean by social justice? Does that mean everyone's going to be equal? Or is social justice some sort of, uh, will it emerge from free markets? What exactly do we mean by social justice? Well, anyways, depending on how you define these terms, human needs, social justice, conservation, you could come up with a more precise understanding of that idea that would look something like consume, sustainability would be to consume as much as you want without infringing on other humans' interest to do the same. Or you might come up from that definition that sustainability means to consume as little as necessary to maintain a healthy, meaningful life. Both definitions come from that one and they represent really different purposes, I think. And they also, I think, would end up in really different worlds. And so again, maybe many of you as individuals have thought about some of these things and maybe you as individuals kind of have a feeling for what the purpose of sustainability is, but I am pretty sure that a, at a societal level, we're not all on the same page about that. And um, even for people who are really, really deeply committed to sustainability, not all on the same page. And I, I don't know that we're gonna end up in the right place unless we have better and more conversations about that underlying purpose. So I'm gonna talk about purpose in two parts. That was the first part. Now I'm gonna talk about it in a second way that's gonna end up being uh, a little bit more uh, personal in a, in a sense about each of our own persons and our own lives. Uh, to do so, I have to give a little tiny overview of some very basic ethical theory. I would say for the next couple of minutes, just enjoy, enjoy the theory for its own sake. You'll see how it becomes useful in just a moment. In ethics, there are several like frameworks or ways of thinking about ethics. And here we're looking at a slide that depicts two of these. One is called deontology. It was initially developed by a fellow whose name was Immanuel Kant. Another is called utilitarianism, developed by a guy named Jeremy Bentham. Both of these people are working in the early part of the 19th century. Deontology, which is a terrible name, it's not very, it doesn't give you much of a clue as to what it is unless you know Greek. Um, it basically says that right actions are the ones that fulfill whatever duties we have to others. And utilitarianism says, no, that's not correct. The most right actions are those that result in the greatest utility or you can think benefit to the most people. So you can think of the one on the left as being duty bound ethics. And you can think about the one on the right as being more concerned with the consequences of our actions. Okay. It's useful, I think, to just kind of appreciate that these are really formal systems of thinking, but at the very same time, we also have some kind of basically kind of common folk, but still useful understandings of them, duty-bound ethics and consequentialism. Duty-bound ethics is kind of tied to the idea that the ends do not necessarily justify the means. Consequentialism is tied to the idea that, oh yes, indeed, it is the case that ends can justify the means. If you're interested in duty-bound ethics, lying is never okay, basically because it's deceitful. Consequentialism would say, well, you know, there will be some occasions where white lies, for example, are okay. Now, ethicists um, and psychologists have been interested to understand how it is that these two different frameworks sometimes lead to the same answer, which is often the case. But sometimes when confronted with a situation, these two forms of ethics lead to different answers. And here's a thought experiment. It's mostly for the sake of curiosity, I think, at least for our purposes now. The thought experiment goes like this. There's a trolley car, it's coming down the tracks. There's five people that have been tied to the tracks. If nothing happens, those five people are gonna be killed. You have to be standing on a bridge next to another person. And you have a choice, you can do nothing, in which case those five people will all be killed, or you can take the person that's sitting next to you, push them over the bridge, They'll get killed by the trolley car, but it'll stop their trolley car and save the five people. So if you are a consequentialist, you would push that person over the bridge as fast as you can determine that five is a bigger number than one. If you're a duty bound person, you would say it's my duty to not kill an innocent person and pushing that person over the bridge would be to kill an innocent person. I'm not doing that. It's just a thought experiment. It has some utility, but it gives a good example of how the view that you take, a duty-bound approach or a consequentialist approach, sometimes lead to these kind of paradoxical or difficult to resolve circumstances. Let me give you an example of one that comes from biodiversity. 
imagine you have two people having a conversation. One is a consequentialist, the other is a deontologist. And the consequentialist says, barred owls should be killed. It's absolutely necessary to prevent spotted owls from going extinct. Let me give you a little bit of background. Spotted owls live in the Pacific Northwest. They're an endangered species. Barred owls are a common species and their geographic range has been expanding. And whenever barred owls and spotted owls come to the same place, kind of living in the same area, the same part of the forest, barred owls usually outcompete the spotted owls. So barred owls are in a sense a threat to the persistence of spotted owls that motivates the consequentialist. But the deontologist says, no, 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 no. Humans really are the ones that are culpable for the plight of spotted owls, not the barred owls. And so no, no, we shouldn't be killing those barred owls. The consequentialist, but, but think of the consequences. Extinction is forever. And these spotted owls, man, they're, they're, they're gonna be gone forever. We can't let that happen. We gotta kill the barred owls. And the deontologist would say, no, 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 no. Overlogging of old growth forest, that's the ultimate cause of spotted owl endangerment. That's a wrong that we did. And that wrong is not made right by killing spotted owls. And so you, you might find yourself sitting in the middle of these two people, not really sure what to do. It's an example of something that's actually sadly common in conservation, where it is that individuals of one species have to be killed, or some people think have to be killed in order to protect and other species. And the most common frameworks for thinking about these ideas are deontology and consequentialism. And they sometimes can lead to what would seem to be an impasse. And so, but thankfully there are more tools in ethics. There's another framework. And that framework is referred to as virtue ethics. Virtue ethics is something that was developed first by Aristotle. It was forgotten. We'll talk a little bit about how and why it was forgotten in a little bit. It was by the time that Immanuel Kant and um, Jeremy Bentham came along. There wasn't a lot of attention given to it. Um, Aristotle's basic idea is that your behaviors, whether they're ethical or not, they arise from the virtues that you hold and how well you are at practicing those virtues. And Aristotle further thought that the virtues that you embrace depend on the purpose that you set for your life. And so Alistair McIntyre is a philosopher who in the 1980s kind of, oh, I don't know how to say it, modernized virtue ethics for like a 20th and 21st century kind of a person. And the thoughts that I share with you next are, uh, they, they belong to him. Um, he appreciated that our purpose is not always the same. If you travel across time and across cultures, the purposes differ. And because of that, the virtues differ. And because of that, the behaviors differ. In Homer's world, think the Iliad and the Odyssey, the purpose of life was to be a heroic hero. And therefore, the values that matter with things like bravery and to be cunning and things that you don't even think of as being virtues, like to be deceitful. But if you were good at practicing that stuff, you'd be a heroic warrior. In Aristotle's time and place, a good citizen, that's the purpose of life. That means that the virtues that are most important are honesty and magnanimity and forbearance. And if you practice those virtues, you'll be behaving like a good citizen. According to Augustine, the purpose of life is to be a child of God. And that brings to mind virtues like faith, hope, and charity. If you practice those well, you'll be a good child of God. The Enlightenment came along. And by this time, philosophers of the Enlightenment, this includes people like Hans and Bentham, they have to have explanations both for science and for ethics that are not tied to God in their view. And also when they threw out God, they threw out the notion of purpose. They just thought it was too indefinite to talk about. To know what your purpose is in life isn't something you could prove through the principles of science. So they just weren't interested in it. And with that, the purpose of a human life in Western ethics really took a big ding to say the least in terms of its relative importance. And so let's return to these ideas about, um, about sustainability. We've seen this slide before, the open-ended question, and I'm only gonna leave it as a question, maybe we can talk about it in Q&A, is those two purposes at the top, those two boxes at the top, I think they're pretty sensible ways of thinking about the purpose of sustainability. The question is, to what extent do, especially the one on the right, consume as little as necessary, to what extent does every human have to embrace that as the core of their purpose for sustainability to have any chance at all of, of, of being realized? Um, 
just to make other like points of contact, there's a Japanese notion that's um, the Japanese word is on the left, the English pronunciation is on the right, ikigai. Ikigai is a way of, uh, of helping a person discover their purpose. And it comes from answering a few questions, including this thing that might be your purpose. Do you love it? Are you good at it? And does the world need it? And if the answer to those three questions all point to this thing, whatever it might be, then that very well may your, be your purpose. It's not entirely unrelated to a, a Greek idea that's known as eudaimonia. Eudaimonia has to do with living a flourishing life. It's a lot of what Aristotle used to kind of base his idea uh, about, about virtue ethics. And so uh, my point here is very, very simple, is that this notion of purpose is almost undoubtedly important for understanding conservation and how to bring it about in the world. And it's, it's something that has many layers. It has a, has a social layer and it has, has a personal layer as, as well. Part three, intrinsic value. In just a few minutes, I'm gonna answer three questions for you. What is it? Who has it? And how does it matter? And so first of all, intrinsic value, it's, it's an important idea in environmental ethics. And the best way to think of it is to think about a very simple object like a hammer. Hammers are valuable to us because they have a function, things like pounding nails, and if you break or lose your hammer, you don't think too much about, well, I'll just go get another one. So they're replaceable. And we say that hammers are useful for what it is that they do, not so much what they are. Um, and so these are all instrumental values. And this is the kind of a thing that typically is thought to have essentially only instrumental value. But now we can think of a young child for just a moment. And a young child, we would say, um, has value for its own sake. Um, the young child is valuable for what he or she does, not what he or she, or for, he, for what he or she is, not for what he or she does. And not to be mistaken, a young child can do things that are useful, mow the lawn, take the trash out, take the trash out, do the dishes, but that's not what makes them valuable. And they're irreplaceable. If they were lost, sure, you'd find another way to get the lawn mowed, but there's no way to replace that child. And so we say that the child has intrinsic value. So instrumental value, that something's just useful for doing something, is, is basically the foil or the way of thinking what intrinsic value is. Intrinsic value is whatever's extra left over from an instrumental value um, when you're done thinking about that. What does it mean? If someone possesses intrinsic value, what it means is that they're entitled to be treated fairly. That is to be treated with concern for their well-being. And so now we can move on to, and we'll return to that idea of what that means in just a moment. But first, and our time is a little short, so I want to keep moving at this kind of quick pace. Um, who has intrinsic value? One of the easiest ways to enter into answering the question is to ask, well, what is it about humans that imbues us with intrinsic value? I'm going to use that symbol IV as short for intrinsic value. And so we can just ask, what trait is it that we have that imbues us with intrinsic value? And you might come to the answer, and this is just a working idea. Maybe we haven't, well, we certainly have an interest to avoid pain. Maybe that's the thing, that interest is what gives us intrinsic value. If that's the case, then anything else that has that trait, an interest to avoid pain, would also have intrinsic value. Okay, so birds and mammals, absolutely. They all have an interest to avoid pain, so they would all have intrinsic value. And I'm going to be provocative here for just a moment. Fish. I'm going to pretend like the year is 1980. And in 1980, many fish biologists, very well-informed folks, were not on the same page about whether fish could experience pain or not. Some of it had to do with biases, like they're just so different from us, they couldn't possibly experience pain. Some of it is that their central nervous systems are really very differently organized than ours. I'm being provocative and actually now, thankfully, in the year 2023, most qualified fish physiologists understand that fish actually do have a interest to avoid pain. Insects, at least as we understand what pain means, probably no. But we can go back and revise the logic if we want. Maybe avoiding pain isn't the thing that imbues us with intrinsic value. Maybe it's something more basic. Maybe it's an interest, interest to flourish. And if flourishing is the trait that gives us intrinsic value, then anything else that has that interest or capacity would be as well. Fish certainly have a capacity to flourish. Insects, absolutely as do many other kinds of creatures. And so, so this is the answer to the question, who has intrinsic value? Quite a few things beyond humans. Now, 
what does it mean that so many non-humans would have intrinsic value? Well, it means, as we had said before very, very briefly, that these things are entitled to be treated fairly. And I want to really focus on that word fairly. What does that mean? Fairly is an idea that we most commonly understand when thinking about our relationship with other humans. And so folks who think about social justice, who theorize about social justice, have kind of become comfortable with recognizing four values associated with fairness. Need, do you need something? Equality, to what degree should we be treated equally? Equity, which is equity is used differently by scholars than it is in kind of a popular uh, sort of uh, um, use of the word. It basically means uh, you deserve something, like for example, because you've earned it. Um, entitlement has kind of a bad connotation in our everyday language, but it really means it's like it's my right to have something. Um, when we think about those values, when we think about social justice, when we think about fairness, it's most commonly in relationship to other humans. We're not very good at manifesting these values at a global scale and at national scales, but in our everyday individual lives, we exercise these values every day. We're really, we're not all equally good at it, but we're pretty familiar with it, even though we may not have had all those words attached to it. But what we as humans individually, collectively, society type scales are less familiar with is to what degree and how do those four values relate to non-human animals? And how do they relate to entire ecosystems, some portions of which aren't even necessarily typically viewed as being living things? And so I'm just kind of pointing this out as a frontier for which um, scholars certainly have not got this sorted out. And I think even for regular folks, like some of the stuff you can intuit, well, I think I understand how some of those things would relate to certain animals, like the needs that your pet dog has is pretty straightforward. And if you have a pet dog, you better have that figured out. But but does your dog deserve things in the sense that it's earned them? I don't know. Um, we haven't thought about that very much. Um, so I want to leave that one kind of hanging as a loose end because that's how it is for scholars at the moment. What I want to do, this is my last thought, is take these ideas about intrinsic value and try to make them at least give a toehold about how they can be useful. Because what I've done up until now is fairly abstract, I appreciate. And so I don't know if this is useful, but I don't know. Imagine you're in a bar with Will Smith and Margot Robbie. I don't know. And Will Smith says, hey, I, I think it's wrong to kill wolves because they have intrinsic value. The other person says, I don't know what that means, but I'm sure wolves don't have it. And, uh, and Will Smith says, yes, they do. I heard it during this webinar that I listened to. And Margot Robbie says, no, they don't. And so that's not the most useful way to employ what it is that you may have just learned or what you may have already known that I've shared with you about the nature of intrinsic value. But let me show you how it is that intrinsic value can be so very, very valuable for a conversation that anyone can have, even if you have no expertise or speciality in, in talking about ethics. The conversation might go like this. People should be allowed to hunt wolves if they want to. Uh, okay, is it okay to kill an animal without a good reason? because really that's the essence of what it means to possess intrinsic value. If you're gonna do any killing, you gotta have a good reason. And um, the other person says, uh, no, of course not. You have to have a good reason if you're going to kill another animal. What do you suppose if there's a reason some people wanna kill, kill wolves? Uh, I think it's because, and then you have to listen to what they say. And who knows what they might say, it depends on who you're talking to. It might be because I'm afraid of them, it might be because they're dangerous to humans, it might be because they eat cows. You just say, I got to listen to the answer. And then you have to be able to say, I don't know, that just doesn't seem fair. And here's the reason why. And so you see, when we acknowledge that non-humans have intrinsic value, that's not the end of the conversation. That's the very, very beginning of the conversation. And it's a conversation you can have with almost anyone, at least in my experience. I've never met not one single person who thinks it's okay to kill an animal with no reason. We vary greatly on what counts as a good reason. But we need to be talking more with people that we agree with and people we disagree with about what counts as good reasons. Anyways, that's just one example of how to make some of that possibly useful. And I think this is a good time for us to, or for me to stop and move on to the next part of our little program here. And so I'll call on Chelsea and we'll let her kind of lead us through this next part. Okay, thank you so much, John. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, I think I have, 
many questions that I um, have for you. There's a couple coming through um, in the chat box as well. Um, I think I'll start with um, this question, I guess, because this will also relate to it. There's one question that I want to um, ask from the chat box, box as well. Um, so in your presentation at the beginning, there's, it's kind of highlighted this role of ethics in the biodiversity crisis. And I wonder if you could put on your population biologist hat for a moment and talk a little bit about the role that wolves play in maintaining biodiversity. Oh, well, my, so, oh boy, this is an interesting one. My first answer is that it's not the right question. <laughs> and here's why. So, so one of the things that wolves do is that uh, they can sometimes, not always, uh, reduce the abundance of ungulates. And in some parts of the world, there's enough ungulates that it causes damage to the forest. Damage to the forest that can be problematic for other things that live in the forest. And sometimes damaging to the forest in a way that's troublesome for humans because humans are interested to sometimes log, even sustainably log the forest. And it's hard to do so when there's so many ungulates, deer or elk, whatever the cute. I'm talking about white-tailed deer in this particular case. And so wolves can be helpful for that. The reason that I think this is the wrong question to lead with in terms of thinking about biodiversity and ethics in wolves is that what I've just mentioned is an instrumental value of wolves. That's what wolves do. And, and the trouble with saying the reason we should protect wolves is because of what they do is that not all scientists are on exactly the same page about just how important those things are. And you don't want, I think, your answer to why we should protect wolves to be contingent on a scientific idea that might change tomorrow when new evidence is brought forth. When really the reason to protect wolves is that you should treat them fairly. And that includes not killing them without a good reason. And I haven't yet seen a good reason to kill wolves in this sense of like recreational hunts and, and population control and, and stuff like that. So, so there's a little bit of an answer of what it is that wolves do that's good for biodiversity and also why it's not the most important thing to know about wolves. Yeah, I love that answer. Thanks, John. Um, this is one of the first questions that was coming through. Um, and I know that you will probably have an answer to this because you are a population biologist, but um, have you seen any wolves in the wild? And if so, what did they look like? How did it make you feel? I think like the main question of like, how did that maybe first or several sightings of wolves make you feel yeah. in that moment? Um, so so I, I do study wolves and so I've seen wolves up close. Um, I've seen wolves from an airplane um, hours and hours and hours worth, but I've also seen moose and because I study moose as well. And you know what my interest is in life is to um, better understand what it's like to be a wolf or what it's like to be a moose. And in, and in that regard, you know, the first thing to know is it's not normal or right to be close to a wolf. So, so when I do it, it's a compromising of my own values to be close to a wolf. Uh, it's not on their terms, it's on mine, usually. And, and being close to a wolf has not once helped me understand what their lives are all about. Uh, knowing what a wolf's life is all about comes from knowing actually a little bit about your dog. Because dogs are just a particular kind of a wolf. Wolves are social creatures that live in families just like you do. But one thing that's wild, crazy different about their lives is that it's, here's the population biologist, it's normal in the life of a wolf, in a pack of wolves, for one in four wolves to die each year. That's maybe one in five, something like that. That's normal. So imagine living in a family group where it was normal for one of your family members, one out of five of your family members to die every year. I, have, I can't even imagine what that would be like. And if you know, like, do they feel that in a bad way? Your dog is upset when you're gone for the weekend unexpectedly in their view. And so if they can miss you, I'm sure they can miss a, a pack mate. And the other thing, uh, that's way way you can really appreciate what their lives are like because we have that close connection with wolves living in families. Another thing that's like mind blowingly different is to appreciate how do you know the world? Well, most of us know the world mostly through our eyes. We get more information from our eyes than anything else. It's not true for wolves. They learn more about the world through their nose than any of their other senses. 
wow, what is life like when most of what you learn is through your nose? Anyways, this is what's most important to me about knowing and understanding wolves. And they come prime, they, they didn't come from being close to a wolf. So the most amazing experiences I've had about wolves is as actually reflecting on that stuff. And so anyways. Yeah, I think it's so important to reflect on how wolves and other species just perceive, perceive this world so differently than us and that yeah. really inform how we understand them as well. Yeah, and I mentioned very briefly moose. The, the thing I have to say that's different about moose is that a moose, ah, I think I like them more than I like wolves. Here's the reason why. It's not right to be close to a wolf. That's not their interest. And But a moose, you can actually you can get a moose to be comfortable with your presence. Very careful, a wild moose. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it unless you know what you're doing, um, but it's been my job to have to observe moose. And so I've become familiar with moose. And so I, I think I appreciate them really just because I can be closer to them on their terms. I think they're harder to understand though. Uh, I, I, don't, I think what happens between the ears of a moose is remarkable, but probably beyond my imagination mostly. That's so interesting. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. And when I think about wolves, as I mean, most of us might, I, there's this feeling of, you know, they can be described as one of the most polarizing animals in the West. You know, yeah. we either want are driven to conserve them and restore their populations like you talked about, or hunt them or completely eradicate them from the wild. What do you think it is about wolves that drives so much passion from people? Yeah, I, I think it's that um, for better and for worse, uh, and quite unfairly to wolves, we've made them symbols. They're symbols of all kinds of things. They're symbols, and they have been for, this is not a Western phenomenon, Western North American phenomenon. This is a, this is a human phenomenon for thousands and thousands of years. Wolves are symbols of all the things that we love and cherish about nature, and they're symbols of all the things that we hate and fear about nature all at the same time. And we put all of that burden on wolves, and it's as, it's as wrong as making um, putting a human on a pedestal that they don't belong on. Um, and then, and then in our, in our, if we think of like North America, United States, and Canada, we've we've piled on to that symbolism because you know wolves can be symbols of government control, and they can be symbols of that other group of people, that, the other group of humans that we don't like, the ones that love wolves, and I don't like them and all their kind. I don't like wolves because of the people who like wolves, and, uh, and I don't like those people who hate wolves because they don't like wolves. And so, so yeah, we 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 layer symbol upon symbol on wolves is. It's, it's, it's tragic for wolves. At, at the very same time, I don't know that it's avoidable. I mean, humans uh, is one of, the, one of the things that does separate us from nature is our absolute fascination with symbolizing things. And so, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's tough. Yeah, and we're getting a lot of um, comments from high school students as well. And I just, um, I'm seeing kind of a trend here too. So I want to read this comment and question from a high school student in her in their junior year um, who wants to become a wildlife biologist and is looking into colleges right now and considering Mich Michigan Tech. Um, so it's pretty cool to have you on here. Um, so their question is, do you ever get overwhelmed and discouraged to continue working when reading about the environmental crisis? If so, how do you deal with it? Right, right. It's such a beautiful question. And I think the most important answer to offer actually ties to some of what we spoke about today. Remember those two ideas about consequentialism and to be duty bound. If you're a consequentialist, and, and you got to keep in mind, everyone is a mixture of both. Everyone's got a little consequentialism in them and everyone's got a little bit of deontology or being duty bound. There are always times when we're principled and there are always times when we're like, you, the word we use sometimes is pragmatic. I'm going to do the practical thing, which is to say, I'm going to do the thing that leads to the good outcome. Here's the thing is if, if you look at the world and you see, oh my goodness, this is one catastrophe after the next, the outcome couldn't possibly be good. That I'm, I don't think I want to participate in that. That's to be a consequentialist in that moment. That's to say, 
the value of my actions depends on what I think the ultimate outcome is going to be. That's the wrong time and place to be thinking consequentially, I think. I think this is the time to be duty bound, in which case you, you, you look at the world and because here you can be honest and you can be honest, say, oh my gosh, there's a lot of tragedy in the world. There are a lot of bad things in the world and there's good things too. And I have a duty to play in all this and the duty that I play doesn't actually depend on the outcome. It depends on what's the right thing for me to do. And the purpose of my life comes from doing the right thing, not being too worried about the outcome. And so the way that I get by is to not worry about the consequences. That's, it's not on me how it turns out. What's on me is, is how I behave. And that has allowed me to be quite facile with staring straight in the face, genuine tragedies without calling them anything but, but also looking at other cases like, wow, that is, a, that is a remarkably hopeful story that I just heard. That is an amazing person doing great stuff. They inspire me. I want to behave just like that too. And so, so anyways, I think the answer to that is about knowing when to be a consequentialist and when to be duty bound and, and, and to let the purpose of your life be filled by that duty. And you don't worry about the consequences. Yeah, I think this leads well into kind of this question. I'm going to, this is a little bit of a question of my own um, with one from the audience too. Um, but in your writings, you've argued that scientists are citizens before other scientists and advocacy is a responsibility of every citizen. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how ethics has informed your scientific work, your advocacy, and then um, this is a question from the audience of, of how policies in Mich Michigan are affecting conservation efforts in relation to your work and your advocacy? Oh, well, um, so, I mean, this is um, very kind of a science centric sort of a thing. So th there's lots of different kinds of people in life. There are professional professionals of all different kinds, teachers and lawyers and religious leaders and one of those types is a scientist. And But all these people are also citizens too. And so what has, come to be the case is that um, many voices in society have told scientists you shouldn't be an advocate. Your job is to discover facts and share us, share with us the facts and keep your policy views to yourself. Um, and I've not appreciated that view and I've not appreciated that view because it somehow Im implies or supposes that if I'm a scientist, I'm no longer a citizen and that's not true. I'm a citizen and a human long before I'm a scientist. And so as a citizen, I have an obligation. It's not just a it's not just a privilege or an opportunity, it's an obligation to stand up for what's right and to work against what's wrong. And so, but as a scientist, I also have obligations too. And you do have to kind of negotiate them properly. Here's the thing is that if we're talking about science, like what's the mortality rate of wolves or what's the typical percent growth rate? You know, I'm kind of an expert in that. And, and if another person's not an expert, then, you know, I'm the authority on that idea, a scientific idea. And that means my burden is to explain that so that another person is satisfied with the explanation. But if we get to a value question, like should we kill wolves or not in a particular situation, on that occasion, I don't have special authority. I'm just another citizen, just like someone else. Um, you, you know, I've, I've been trained so that I speak well in public and I've thought about things in a lot of ways that um, maybe other people haven't had a chance to think about. So that might make me more facile on some of these things. But basically, here's the point is that when I'm speaking in public about ethics, I owe my critics an explanation for why I believe that way. And, and, and it's my perspective that I own that explanation until they're satisfied. And if they're never satisfied, I'll keep providing explanations until they I suppose until they get tired of hearing my explanations or until they're satisfied. And I want to be listening to them too, because I don't have it all right either. And I want to hear why they think I got it wrong. And I want to, but I want them to explain themselves to my satisfaction too. And so, so I think the whole point is this, is that science has a particular kind of a discourse that to some extent does involve some people are experts and other people aren't in particular things. And that's how that business goes. But ethics is, is in a very important way. Everyone's on a level playing field and the demand of everyone is the same. Explain yourself to the satisfaction of the other person. And, and here's the thing, we're always concerned about the other person's explanation, but we're actually not, I, th I think you might've gotten the impression from what I shared today. We might not be as brushed up on the skill of explaining ourselves to our critics as we might think. It's hard, it takes practice. 
And if you go into a coffee house or a bar and find somebody who disagrees with you about killing wolves, try to explain to them to their satisfaction why you think it's not right to kill wolves in a particular way. And, uh, and the degree that you have trouble with it is in some degree the degree to which you will want to hold up on that skill. Yeah, thanks for that. And on this subject of, you know, reasons that people feel that wolves might they might be justified to kill wolves. There are a lot of kind of comments coming through. Um, I mean, we are, Rain Coast is yes. um, you know, situated in BC and yeah. I know you're you're in the States, but I wonder um, because one of the big topics of discussion and especially this has, you know, the role of science, but also the role of ethics in making these decisions around um, the BC wolf call. Um, so for those that aren't familiar, you know, in BC, every winter, um, hundreds of wolves are killed each year um, in caribou habitat. Um, woodland and mountain caribou are critically endangered. And so this is kind of one of the um, the thoughts that you've discussed and that kind of is aligned with what you've been talking with in your presentation. So I wonder maybe even if you could walk through like how someone might come to a a decision on how they feel about um, the wolf call. Sure. Um, so remember from the presentation, I gave that little cartoon dialogue about the barred owls and the spotted owls. And so that basic idea there was, hey, we should kill, some people think we should kill barred owls to save spotted owls. That is a, that conversation that I portrayed is actually, you could just swap out the names barred owls and spotted owls with caribou and wolves. And the basic idea I suspect some of your audience knows the details better than I'm about to portray them. I'm going to portray the scientific details very briefly so I can get to the ethical perspective. Basic idea is that some scientists think that if you don't kill a lot of wolves in perpetuity, caribou are going to go extinct. Other people's response to that is, yeah, but wolves aren't the reason why caribou are endangered. Wolves are an innocent bystander in this whole thing. The bigger picture matters, and the bigger picture includes this, asking the question, why are there so many wolves? The answer to that is because there's an awful lot of moose, and it's moose that enable wolves to be really abundant. And so wolves and moose, they kind of get along so fine because the moose are abundant. They can tolerate the predation rates. And while the wolf eats an occasional caribou, as far as the wolf is concerned, that occasional caribou is a big loss to the caribou population. So that's the ecology that's going on. And we got into that by asking, why are wolves so abundant? And then I said, well, it's because moose are so abundant. So you got to ask the question, why are moose so abundant? And the answer to that question is because in the Western part of Canada, there's an awful lot of gas and oil exploration. And that involves uh, cutting the forest in ways that are really beneficial to moose. It creates habitat that's just amazing for the moose. And so here's the point, the consequentialist in this view becomes fixated on just, hey, if we don't kill wolves, we're gonna lose the caribou. But there's a different kind of consequentialist out there as well. And a different kind of consequentialist says, uh, yeah, but there are consequences for that wolf and that kind of the wolf that gets killed. And that's pretty permanent too, if you're that wolf. And then there's a deontologist that says, hey, it ain't even about the wolves. It's huge. I'm gonna use this word very, very carefully. It's a word that we, it's not in our everyday language, but I, I know you know it. Wolves aren't culpable. It's the humans that are culpable. So it's not about who caused what, and it's not about the consequences of which action, it's about who's responsible for the mess. And it's humans that are responsible for that mess. And what's especially tragic is that you would keep killing wolves and not fix the problem that's causing wolves to be so abundant in the first place, which is ultimately a force management problem, which is tied to gas and oil exploration. And so anyways, um, it, it's it's a mess, really, that kind of a decision. It, it's, uh, I mean, it's it's a, like an environmental Sophie's choice because well, caribou are amazing and they're not doing well. And, and wolves don't deserve to be treated that way. And so what's the proper response to a Sophie's choice scenario? Don't get into that situation in the, in the first place, if, if at all possible. And of course, humans at a societal level are doing all things to, all sorts of things to put themselves in that situation. Um, so anyways, yeah, that's a little bit about that. A big complicated issue though, of course. Yeah, definitely. Well, thanks for that. And I know we've talked a little bit about this in past conversations, but I, I think it's um, 
really some, an important topic to talk about with our audience today. And I um, was hoping that you could talk a little bit about the role that emotions play in ethical decision making. You know, in one of your publications, I think it was with Michael Nelson, there's yeah. a quote, emotions are essential for a healthy ethic. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that and then touch a little bit on empathy as well and empathy towards both humans and non-human animals. Sure. And um, so with, I think the question about emotions is it can be usefully set up by just having a scenario in mind. The scenario cuts both ways. So you're in some kind of a public forum, for example, imagine, and people are talking about say wolf management and, uh, and, and somebody's at the podium and, and they're screaming or crying or pounding their fist. And, and those expressions of emotion, they could be attached with, these are the reasons we should kill wolves, <laughs> or they can be attached to, these are the reasons we should not be killing wolves. And um, I think, it, but, but here's the trouble is that when we hear a person emoting like that, we sometimes discount their view. We just say, oh, they're just being emotional. And, and I, I think, at least from my perspective, when I see somebody being emotional, I, I, first of all, I don't think that's a problem. That's to, that's to be human, to be emotional. And it only means one thing. It just means that the thing that they're saying, they care about very, very deeply. It doesn't mean they're right about it. It doesn't mean they're wrong about it. It just means they care about it so intensely. And so I do think that in a heightened state of emotion like that, it can be hard to have a conversation that always builds understanding. And that can be a reason to kind of, let's find a way to settle the emotions down just a little bit, but it doesn't make emotions fundamentally inappropriate. It doesn't make displays of emotion wrong. Um, so that's, that's like public displays of, emo of, of emotion, like maybe more internally. Um, you know, so many of our um, beliefs about ethics are intuitive. Um, they're not, you know, we, we don't, and thank God they're intuitive, right? You make countless ethical decisions every single day. And if you had to reason through each one of them with great care, you, you'd have trouble getting out of your bed in the morning. So we make lots of ethical decisions uh, intuitively. And, and those intuitions are, are prompted often by our emotions. And emotions, emotional responses are like, oh, that's bad and wrong. Or like, oh, that's very good and, and right. And, and they serve us well frequently. Um, not always, though. And so anyways, it's to be emotional is to be not human. And uh, sometimes it's a very good guide. And sometimes it needs to be, you know, dialed back just a little bit because there's other parts of our brain that are important for thinking through things. With respect to empathy, um, you know, um, I, I, I think empathy is, is, is where it's at for understanding social justice. And that means how it is that we relate to other humans. And that's also how it is we relate to other non-humans. I spoke about empathy when I was talking about imagining the life of a dog and the life of a wolf through their nose and their family lives and how hard it is to imagine the life of a moose. Uh, but that would be empathy if to whatever degree you're able to do that. Um, and and yeah, I mean, we, we need more empathy, not only for non-human animals, but actually also for the other humans that we disagree with. I think some of the humans that we disagree with, they're the people that, that, that I think for this audience, if I understand the audience, this audience probably doesn't have too much trouble with working towards empathy towards animals. Some of you are probably very, very good at it, but it might also be the case if I know the audience that some of us might actually struggle with empathizing with other humans that we disagree with. And man, that's that's no less important. I mean, the, the, the anger that a rancher feels when their cow is killed by a wolf, man, that is the very same anger that you experience when a wolf is killed unjustly. And it doesn't mean that their anger is perfectly well-placed, though you can certainly understand why they feel it. And it doesn't mean that they're necessarily justified in whatever action comes next, but, but never, nevertheless, the, that understanding that empathy is important. And empathy is different from sympathy to understand another's perspective doesn't require agreeing with it, but understanding it is, man, it's just so, so important for us, the royal us, the big us, to better get on the same page, especially with the people we disagree with. Great, well, it seems like we're kind of at time and I wanna respect our audience here and you, John, in terms of uh, the time. And I think that this is a great um, piece to end um, the episode on. So I'm gonna kind of start to wrap it up here. 
Um, so I just want to thank everyone in our audience for taking the time to join us tonight and um, contributing really thoughtful questions. We really appreciate that. And John, I really appreciate your time and effort that you've put into tonight and to our colleagues at Raincoast who made this happen in addition to our collaborators, the Wolf Conservation Center. Um, and if you're interested in learning more about wolf conservation, please stay tuned for the rest of the series. Our episode next week with Dr. Paul Paquette has been moved and we will keep you updated on the new date and time once it's been rescheduled. So please watch out for that. And in two weeks time, we will be having wildlife photographers, um, Marcy Calavert-John and Melissa Grew to talk about the ethical considerations of wildlife photography and best practices when it comes to shooting wolves and other predators in the wild. And if you're interested in learning more, please visit the Wolf Conservation Center in person or at the link that I've included below here. Um, or you can visit Raincoast at raincoast.org to find more information about wolves and I also highly recommend, and I saw in the chat box, others have been recommending um, to check out John's book. I'll put the link here. Um, it is called Restoring Balance, What Wolves Tell Us About Our Relationship with Nature. Um, so to end off, John, I just want to let you have the last comment if you have anything to say about wolves to close this out. Oh, um, wolves speak for themselves. So just to speak for myself, I'm so grateful for the time that you all shared tonight. It was uh, really very pleasurable for me to share the time with you, and I, I hope you enjoyed it. Great. And thank you, everyone, again. Um, hope to see you in our next episodes, and have a great night, everyone. Good night.